Hey guys, welcome back to another video and this will be episode 2 of my hot take series that I started a long time ago actually. I made a video back in I think late 2022 with the main topic being focused on where mythic items a mistake and I had a lot of fun making it because well for one it was unscripted and I don't get too many opportunities to kind of just speak my mind out to you guys. Usually I script my video, I write it, I edit and curate it and make sure it sounds as presentable as possible in a more professional manner. But every once in a while I do enjoy being able to just speak without having to premeditate it. And um, yeah, so we're going to get started on episode 2. If you guys saw a couple weeks ago or depending on when I upload this, I made a community post asking for more hot takes. So just like the first episode, what I'll be doing is I'll be going through a few of them offering my thoughts and opinions on it, and then I guess we'll go from there. So in terms of what's happening on screen, it's just going to be gameplay, I hope you're okay with that. So you can kind of treat this like a podcast episode, if you want to minimize it you can, or you can watch me in 10 feed if you want, that I'm sure some of you enjoy doing that too. Uh, one more thing is that uh, currently the time I'm recording this, there are many airplanes above me because I live near an airport, and around this time is when, you know, there's a lot of takeoffs and arrivals. So if you hear any like whoosh noise in the background, I'm um, sorry about that. I'll try my best to cut it out. But if there's nothing else to worry about, then let's get right on with it. So I'll be showing every take I read on screen just in case I can't pronounce the name of the person. I apologize. But uh, first one's going to be from this person who says, I despise autofill. But if Riot actually removed it, I damn know the community will start complaining about how they aren't able to queue into games for long times. This has been something that's been weighing on the minds of a lot of high elo players I imagine, is that where's the trade-off in which the quality of the game comes in contact with the time it takes to actually reach the game. I've had a few opinions say that they are completely against autofill, they would rather wait 10 to 15 minutes to get into a game where all 10 players are in their appropriate roles, rather than waiting 3 or 4 minutes only to find out that their jungle and mid are autofill while the enemy team has 5 players who are in their main roles. And then on the other hand, you have players who are like, oh, I would rather just be able to get into a game quickly, you know, play it out, whether it is good or bad, I just want to be able to access that kind of game. But um, I'm of the school of thought that I personally despise autofill as well. I would rather wait a little bit longer, if not a lot longer, even if it's twice or thrice the amount of time to get into a game. I would rather just get into a game where I don't have to think about my jungle first time in Italy because they've never played jungle before and they figured why not. So this is more of a controversial take, not really a hot take in the sense that it's not an unpopular opinion. I've heard it before, but I do think that it's one of those topics of discourse where it really comes down to what the person prioritizes. Some people just want a ton of games as fast as possible, as quickly as possible, and others want to have less games but of a higher quality. Depending on what faction you align yourself with, that would be kind of like my answer for that topic. Next one's not really much of a hot topic, it sounds like more of a request. But this is from Just a Viewer 44 and uh, they say it would be an amazing idea to talk about the changes that champions that were added to Wild Rift went through. I heard that before and I've also have been requested many times to talk about Wild Rift. To my knowledge, there are some champions who do have pretty significant changes to their gameplay in Wild Rift, one such case being Teemo, whose W becomes a dash and that creates a whole new, I guess, dynamic of fighting the champion. And I do think one day I might make a video kind of comparing the special features or the, the special privileges that Wild Rift champions have that would be a benefit for the champion and an improvement to their gameplay if they were imported into actual League. So maybe I will do one in the future. I think um, there definitely could be room for exploration in that department. I just don't know if many of my viewers care about Wild Rift enough for me to want to talk about it. I myself don't play Wild Rift, but uh, who knows, it could be a fun idea. Maybe sometime during the spring or summer when I'm running out of ideas. Next one is from 80 Carry Yumi. That is a terrible sounding username. No, I'm kidding. Um, anyways, right? Nerfing most of the champion pool out of pro play makes matches way more boring to watch. Okay, so I don't follow pro play as much as I used to. I was very into it back in season 6, 7, 8, and 9, and 10. And then from that point onwards, I kind of stopped because it became pretty apparent that the pro players don't really care too much about innovating and trying out different types of champions and picks and combinations which is what makes a lot of games just turn into the same 10 to 15 champions being picked every single game, just changing hands between teams, depending on pick order. And I think it's not so much that Riot nerfs champions out of pro play, it's more that many champions in solo queue thrive and in many cases depend on a much more, I guess, discordant arena, much less coordination, a much more chaotic environment for them to succeed. For example, you would not see, let's say, Rengar in pro play all that much because he prefers to deal with a team of players who aren't really like, you know, sticking together, who are isolating themselves a lot. You wouldn't really see Katarina in a pro play game because Katarina can be heavily disrupted by any form of coordinated uh, attempts to stop her. Exhaust, crowd control, 
let's say Tom Kench, Alting and stuff like that, it becomes much more difficult to capitalize on a team where all five players are coordinating with each other, all five players are communicating and kind of working on a strategy together. And with execution being the highest at pro play, mechanical things are matchup checks. Like you wouldn't really see people picking Darius top lane in pro play because Darius is a lane bully, very reliant on his opponent, not knowing his strengths, not knowing his moments of vulnerability. And obviously in high elo, everyone knows his moments of vulnerability. That's why Darius is not considered nearly as viable in you know master grandmaster challenger and especially pro play so it's not so much that champions are getting nerfed out of pro play it's more that pro players are aware of a lot of champions and their kind of strengths and weaknesses especially in a team environment and that just happens to eliminate almost the majority of the champion pool plus there's another thing that you have to remember esports teams have a lot of money a lot of investors and a lot of things at stake whenever they compete in lcs lec lck lpl and then eventually msi and worlds investigating a more cavalier strategy or a more, I guess, ambitious strategy of trying, let's say, for lack of a better example, let's say, you know, trying Garen ADC is not really something that they're going to prioritize because the risks far outweigh the benefits. They would rather just settle for something more, I guess, assured, something more studied and researched, right? Because they don't know, for example, if uh, Renekton mid is going to be as uh, popular as just playing Renekton top, or they don't know if they want to try picking let's say, uh, Camille support. I know right now that's kind of the thing going on in challenger support, but you get the idea. They have to take a big risk in order to try different champions, and they would rather not because millions of dollars are at stake, whether they win or lose, not just in terms of prize money, but the status and prestige that their team acquires from winning their home series or winning, you know, the world championship. And I think no matter how much they try to balance it, pro players will almost never pick things like they will never pick Teemo top, they will never pick even Alawi, because Alawi is too easy to shut down if you have a coordinated team. Plus again, if they overbuff champions specifically to see them in pro play, then they will start terrorizing solo queue, and I don't think that's an outcome any of us want. Next take is going to be uh, from Scholar Storm. AB damage to turrets is the most damaging thing to ADC relevance in pub games. Yeah, I would have to agree. Back in the past, AP champions didn't have too good of uh, DPS to towers because they were building AP, not AD. But I believe sometime around season 8 or season 7, they introduced in a special ratio where AP champions can do magic damage to towers, and the scaling happens to be proportionally much higher for AP champions than for AD champs. That's supposed to be kind of counterbalanced by the fact that AP champions seldom if ever build attack speed, and AD champions often do. But when you have, like, let's say Diana, Echo, or anyone who can build Lich Bane, you'll suddenly see them doing, you know, a thousand damage to towers. And then even champions of very slow auto attacks by the ton of AP like Vagar, that little torp does like 1200 damage to towers. Now, you don't really see that until maybe like 4 or 5 items in the mid to late game. But I think the reason why it feels so egregious is because whenever you see it, you think to yourself, wow, these tiny, weak auto attacks are shredding towers faster than let's say a Trundle or a York. I will say that yes, they could afford to tone down the scaling a little bit. There should be more of a trade-off because AP champions tend to be more burst oriented than AD champions, so it makes little sense for them to have high damage to turrets as well. But at the same time, you don't want to punish people for picking AP champions and having the opportunity to do a lot of damage to towers, but not being able to simply because the champion's AP. There has to be a balance in that regard. I think at the current moment, AP champions are definitely overtuned when it comes to doing damage to towers, but I think the overarching problem right now is that it's not that AP champions do too much damage to towers, everyone does too much damage to towers. AD champions, then you have tanks that demolish, especially with, you know, Rift Tail, Void Grubs. I think the main issue is that towers are too frail, especially Nexus and Inhibitor towers. And while I do think that's intentional, because they don't want games to take too long, they don't want turtling to be that easy, they want sieges to be actually threatening, but I've seen even 30 second death timers lead to an entire base being taken all the way from tier 1 tower just because towers fall like they were made of tissue paper because everything just happens to 5 shot towers. It's just kind of one of those things where maybe that might be part of the reason why the games are too snowbally, since there isn't an option to turtle, but at the same time we don't want games going to 40-50 minutes just because you can, you know, perma wave clear under tower and those things take no damage. AP champions doing a lot of damage to turrets is more of a symptom, not the actual cause of the disease. This next one is from Kate Sithism. Split pushers are by far the most annoying class because they can go 0 and 50 and still provide value. You either ignore them and they destroy your nexus by existing, or you send someone after them and have less people to fight with. As the top laner who I consider myself more team fight oriented than split pushers, I can definitely relate to the frustration of destroying the enemy Trindamir or Yorick going like you know 5-0 on them in top lane, 
and then having to rotate and help out your team only for them to backdoor your nexus. Split pushing I think is going to be a permanent facet of League. That's just kind of the nature of MOBA games and it is here to stay. Should it be a viable strategy? That is a question that has been, I guess, constantly in contention and debate since the beginning of time. The idea of especially champions who are, frankly, running it down, like, you know, if you're playing Inting Scion, or even if you're playing Trindamir and you're 0 5 but you build Hallbreaker and you just run it down, should a person be allowed to get away with that? I don't know. That's the thing. On one hand, you do want to give players alternative ways to get back into the game because one of the biggest problems I think with Season 11, 12, and 13 is that they kind of took away other ways for you to get back into the game, right? Like, you, the only way for you to get back into the game is fight. But fighting is not a good idea if you're down 5 6,000 gold because the enemy team is just more powerful than you in terms of stats, items, and even levels. So having other ways to generate pressure and other ways to kind of give your team a way back into the game is important. But I do think that the idea or the notion of having a champion who's 0-10 run down the enemy base, which kind of ties nicely to the previous topic we talked about where uh, towers are too squishy, that's the issue. It's like, split pushing should definitely be a huge risk, and in my opinion, it should carry more risk than reward. It should only be used as a last-ditch effort, and often it is. But in recent times, a lot of champions, especially for example, there was a buff to, I think, Jax, where his W now works on towers, Gragas W works on towers, they made his Sofiora's Q works on towers, Riven passive works on towers. A lot of auto-attack empowerments, or like on-hit bonuses given to basic attacks, now work on towers, which makes it that much easier for them to kill. Then you have things like Demolish, you have items like Hallbreaker, you have so many more ways to kind of make split pushing far more consequential in a shorter period of time. And the reason they did that is because it's easy to rotate from one side of the map to the other with the hypermobility meta that we have. Split pushing used to be a lot more feasible back in the day because the game was slower, champions took a while to go from one place to another, and it just took a long time to take out towers, so it would be more of like a slow and steady battle of attrition in that sense. In the modern day, however, you have it so if you so much as give a top laner or any champion with slow pushing 10 seconds, they could take out 2.5 towers and you're permanently screwed for the rest of the game because you now have to deal with the risk of a backdoor. I do think split pushing should be allowed to exist. I don't think it should be as equal in viability though. I think it should be one of those things where 1 out of every 10 games in my work or maybe 1 out of every 15 or 20 even. I don't think it should be something that you have to constantly be aware of and the way that the game is progressing in balance and in terms of development, I think that split pushing is starting to become more problematic. We saw that come to a head with Hallbreaker essentially making it impossible for you to deal with a champion with it unless you played a champion who can also go Hallbreaker. They fixed that, but then they made it so champions just shred through towers like a knife in hot butter for almost everybody at this point. So I think maybe the first thing they should do is make it so split pushing can only be accomplished by a small handful of champions efficiently and not make it so anyone can be a good split pusher. And at the current moment, a lot of champions can be a good split pusher because we talked about before, AP champions doing a lot of damage to towers and also a lot of champions having their auto attack empowerments apply to towers when previously they didn't. Okay, so we'll do about two or three more comics and we'll call it a day. Uh, I'm sorry if I ramble too much for certain comments, I kind of just, this is the main reason why I script my videos because I go on tangents and I tend to digress a lot. So I do apologize that I couldn't get through a lot more, uh, there were tons of comments, I'll do an episode 3 if this one is well received, but anyways this next one is going to be from Spilled Pizza. Earth used to be a fun game mode but the most recent version everyone does meta picks ruining the enjoyment. This is the very reason why I don't play Earth anymore. I used to enjoy Earth a lot back in seasons 5, 6, 7, and 8, since at the time it used to be a novelty thing. It used to be something you would see very rarely, maybe once a year at most, and it was a fun diversion. It was a nice break from the typical grind of solo queue, and I had a lot of fun trying out different champions, seeing what kind of gameplays they had if they didn't have to worry about mana costs, HP costs, cooldowns, and the like. But then as it became more plentiful and more people started playing, Everyone starts to pick the champions that are, you know, super broken in Earth, like Shaco, Zed, Fizz, um, I don't know who else is super broken, maybe Kiana. Then everyone just starts picking those very champions and it kind of spoils the enjoyment because everyone's picking champions that basically play the game in single player mode because without cooldowns and mana costs, they have no counterplay. I like all random Earth a little bit more for that reason, but in general I think, and I remember Greg Street talking about this, every time Earth happens, people quit the game after because Earth kind of burns people out by making them see so much of the game in a high octane, high intensity kind of way that going back to regular solo queue afterwards feels very boring. So I think the main issue with Earth is that for one, they're releasing it too often, it should be maybe once a year, at most it should be more of like a holiday thing, and two, 
players are not picking the most broken overpowered champions and it kind of spoils the fun because now it's kind of competitive versus before you just basically pick whoever you want. So I think Earth definitely needs to be uh, not as common. I think nowadays they release the like three times a year. That's too often in my opinion. And uh, maybe make it so you can't choose your champion. You have to try other champions and see what they can do. Next one is going to be from Dusk Knight 7. There are too many tank items which passes are damage based on proximity. It would be better for general game health if tank item passes are on damage or either for dealing damage after mitigation such as thorn mill or assisting allies in dealing more damage, Abyssal Mask being the perfect example of such premise. I think what they're referring to is aura effects. Right now we have, you know, Hollow Radiance being the magic resist version of Sunfire, we have Sunfire itself, then we have um, I think Unending Despair being another one of them. I kind of get where you're going with this, um, there are only really like 3 items that increase tank damage to champions, unless you count Iceborne Gauntlet, but I think the reason why there are a lot of tank items centered around dealing damage is because tanks need the damage. If you watch my video on tanks, you'll kind of see where I'm going with this, where there's just so much damage in the meta right now that it doesn't really matter what class you play, it just matters how much damage you can do, and tanks not being able to deal damage is a huge problem since they have almost no agency, like if their carries get caught up, then they're basically stuck and they have to wait until they slowly get killed. The reason why they add a lot of damage to tank items, especially with the aura effects, is because that's kind of the only way they can design damage for tanks. That sort of becomes a problem when non-tank champions can be some too, right? That was the whole issue with Tank Echo, Tank Fizz, you know, Tank Akali back when they built uh, Sunfire Iceborne Gauntlet, so it's kind of a balancing act. But I do think that recently it's okay. I think right now they're trying their best to make tank items a little bit more focused on situations. For example, you have Kainic Rukern, which is for magic burst damage. You have Force of Nature, which is for repeated magic damage. You have Spear Visage for healing. Then for armor, you have Unending Despair for long drawn out fights. You have Sunfire for AoE damage. You have Thornmail for Grievous Wounds. And on hit, you have Frozen Heart for attack speed. Things like that. So I think it's currently much better than it used to be. I think tank items used to be more problematic in the past, but I'm just glad that they finally have decent MR items. I feel like magic resist items are always a joke, and having finally items like Kynan Grucran and Hollow Radiance has made the game so much more playable for tanks. The only issue is that with the absence of mythic items, tanks are not doing so well, because tanks are very reliant on mythic items being, frankly speaking, overpowered, right? Like Iceborne Gauntlet, or Heartsteel, or even Sunfire Aegis having um, those mythic passives and just being a bit stronger. So. I don't really agree too much with proximity damage being a problem. There are only like two or three right now, so this would be like the first take that I kind of fully disagree with. But I do understand where you're coming from, and I think it could be there could be more creative ways to design tank items besides just dealing damage by being near them. Okay, last one will be from Sovitis or Sovitis, and they're saying that Riot should focus on balancing existing champions as opposed to releasing new ones. The statement of we can never fully balance the game because players will find new ways to break X isn't a valid excuse to leave existing champions in poor states due to pro play slash poor design. We have over 150 champions now, it's actually almost 170, and we should focus on leveling the playing field. Okay, on one hand, I fully agree with you in that I think Riot should stop releasing new champions, but not for the reasons of balance, more for the reasons of modernization. A lot of people talk about how they would rather Riot just rework all the old champions before they release any new ones because it feels kind of weird to have someone like, let's say, Singed or even um, Trindamir be in the same game as, you know, Hui or Kasante and stuff like that. So that would be the first thing they need to do is they need to modernize all the old champions and finally get through with the rework project. But obviously the reason why they don't is because reworks take a lot of money and they don't really generate any profit because players already have the champion, they already have their skins most likely. So reworks are more of a labor of love, not really an investment. In terms of balance, I actually disagree. The statement of we can never fully balance the game because players will find new ways to break X is a valid excuse to leave certain champions in poor states. And the reason for that is because champions don't have the same things. If you're talking about balancing the game for, say, let's just say a sport like basketball, you have someone who's 165 centimeters versus someone who's 180, the way you can balance it is by, let's say, hypothetically making the 165 person get 15 more centimeters in height, either due to some kind of prosthesis or what have you. And the reason for that is because both players are human, we both have two arms, we both have two legs. That way you can achieve a perfect medium of balance for basketball, because all the players are the same. But in League, and with the champions, every champion is different in some capacity. Darius and Garen are completely different, Mordekaiser and Trundle are completely different, Zed and Talon are completely different, Katarina and Akali are completely different, Vayne and Kaisa are different. There are no two champions that are exactly the same. If every champion was Vayne, if every champion was Kaisa, if every champion was Garen, 
then you can find a balance because all champions have the same range of equipment, same range of, I guess, privileges and abilities and faculties in which they can find victory. But because they're all different, you can never find a perfect balance. And therefore, some champions have to intentionally be kept weak and some champions have to be intentionally kept strong due to their differing accesses. Like you cannot make Cassante as high of a win rate as, say, I don't know, Singed, because Cassante can do so much more. In fact, if you make Cassante a 53% winner champion, he'd be even more egregious than Singed. I do understand where you're coming from in terms of like, you know, certain champions are being left in the dirt, but that's not a balance thing, that's more of a design thing. Like, that's why I'm saying they should rework all the old champions and modernize them before they make new champions, because they're inherently kept back by their gameplay. You can't fix the game just strictly from balance. If you're trying to make it so say Renekton doesn't get permanently screwed over because he's constantly used in pro play, then you have to find a way to redesign Renekton so where he's good in solo queue and pro play at the same time. You can't find a balancing medium for him, and likewise for the entire champion because there is no way to create a perfectly level playing field for all champions when every champion has different things. Some champions have crowd control, some don't. Some champions have true damage, some don't. Some champions have a billion dashes, some don't. With that in mind, you can't be fair because the champions are not fair. Some champions have more, some champions have less, some champions have A, some champions have B. So there is no way you can fully balance the game because indeed, players will find new ways to break X because that's just how the game is. The goal of the balancing team is to basically try their best to steady it as much as possible. Every time they buff a champion, it tips the scales in one direction, so they have to nerf champions the next patch. And then they just keep going back and forth, back and forth, in the hopes that they get as close to a medium as possible. But ultimately, they'll never be able to. So the best way to find that medium is to instead redesign champions, not readjust their numbers. I think I'll end it off here, I'm losing my voice. Um, hope you enjoyed this video. I'm sorry for being super rambly, I kinda go, you know, in circles. This is specifically why I script my videos, because if I don't, then I kinda just repeat the same point I'm trying to make over and over again. But either way, hope you enjoyed this. Uh, let me know your thoughts on the hot takes that I posted in this video in the comments down below, as well as any other hot takes you might have for the next episode. If this video does well, I'll do an episode 3. Apologies also for taking so long to make the second episode. I wanted to make this a normal thing, but I do somewhat consider this low effort content because it's not scripted and I try to avoid doing that too much. But anyways, if you enjoyed the video, it would be great if you could leave a like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at VarsFam, join my Discord server, and even though mythic items have gotten removed, uh, check out the first episode because there are other takes besides the mythic items in which I think you will enjoy hearing about. But till next time, thanks so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you again soon in the next episode. Take care.